God calls us to be a people of hope. But what does that mean? And how in times like these is that even possible? Today we'll discuss these questions with Lisa Brennickmeyer. She's the founder of Walking with Purpose and the author of the Bible study Grounded in Hope. I'm Father Dave Pavonkin. I'm the president of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. And you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Father Dave Pavanka, and I'm the president of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. And today we're talking about becoming grounded in hope. I'm joined by our panelist, Dr. Martin. It's nice to have you. And Dr. Scott Hahn. Always a blessing to have this panelist together. But we're particularly pleased to welcome our special guest today, Lisa Brennick Meyer. Lisa is the founder and the chief purpose officer of Walking with Purpose a Catholic women's Bible study program, and she is also the author of the book, The Bible Study, Grounded in Hope, and it's based on the text from Hebrews. Lisa and I have been friends for a number of years now, but we don't need to worry about that. It's really, really great to have you here. Oh, great to be here as well. So could you maybe just share a little bit with us about Walking with Purpose and sure. what that is and how that came about? Sure. So Walking with Purpose is a Catholic women's Bible study ministry, very much focused on leading women deeper into scripture in a way that does that journey from the head to the heart. So really helps women to apply what they're learning to day-to-day -day life. And we do that whenever possible in the context of community. Yeah. We think women really need life-giving communities where they can be authentic and come as they are. And um, we want to create a space for women where they can come with their doubts, come with their questions. This isn't the place where you need to already know, where you need to be buttoned up or have a mm -hmm. biblical background or even just a strong formation. You come as you are, we meet you there, and we delve into scripture together, constantly looking at the ways in which it applies to our lives, but certainly keeping it very much grounded in the truths of our faith. So the studies have the imprimatur, so they check out. That's great. But we really want to know, you know, answer that question of so what? Now, how do we live this out in our day-to-day -day lives? So it takes place in parishes, but also women do it just in small groups in their homes and as individuals as well. Well, is it possible that these women arrive without having been grounded? in hope. Oh, and yeah. That's your job. <laughs> that's right. I think that's a big part of it. I do really see us in a lot of ways as distillers of hope. We're, we're carrying Christ to them, and um, He's our hope, right? And so that's when a lot of the women come in that place of really needing hope, something they can grasp hold of. Okay. Yeah. So what, what inspired you, other than we're going to assume the Holy Spirit inspired yeah. you to do it, but why? Why now? Why uh, women? Why Bible studies? What was it mm. that was kind of moving in your heart that, that even brought that about? Well, I'm a convert, so I grew up in the evangelical church, and so I, I was raised on scripture, you know, memorizing scripture, reading it, you know, voraciously from the time that I was little, and it was just always a huge part of my spiritual formation, so how I was learning, but also how I was connecting to Christ and, and being comforted and strengthened, and so I couldn't imagine not having that be a part of my, you know, my experience within the church, and so when I came into the church, when I was early married, um, there were wonderful Bible studies out there already in the Catholic Church that I really, really enjoyed. But I found that I was having to add to it in the small group setting to take it to that really practical level and also to bring into the discussion the importance of conversion of heart. I sometimes felt like we were already assuming that women had made that commitment, and um, and I wanted to start writing material that brought that in continuously. and. And what really, it started though with sitting in mass and seeing women, you know, corralling their kids and coming in and, and being present. But I could see a look on their faces as they went where they were just kind of worn out and feeling like, well, I checked the box, hauled the kids here, I came. But I could see there was something more that they were needing to take it into their day-to-day -day life. And what happened as we came together around scripture, everything at Mass became so much more meaningful. Because of course, what is the Mass? It's so loaded with Scripture, and they came to understand what they were experiencing so much better because of it. But it was really motivated out of a desire for that community for myself, um, 
but also to see those women really connect with the Lord, with the living word through scripture in an applicable way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Grounded in Hope is relevant for women and men, of course, mm. but you know, they, they haven't lost the hope for heaven. But I do think that when women get so busy, mm. they have given up their hope for peace today. You know, and so when they arrive at mass, they've corralled the kids and they hope to get through it. You know? <laughs> but, the, but the sense of peace has often been lost, you know, and Easter, the resurrection, it opens up the way. We now have solid basis for hope. But what we really need is a practical basis for the hope on a daily basis and sometimes just from hour to hour. Yeah. And you've tackled a book in the New Testament. We've talked about this. <laughs> I'm so proud of you, you know, oh, because you could have tackled the Gospel of John. You could have tackled, you know, a short book like Ephesians. You tackled a monster of a book, but you've done it practically. Mm -hmm. The book of Hebrews is my own personal passion and has been for 40 years. But to go through this, it's like you can, you can do this in a way that is practical. It's so much about the theology of the old and the new and mm -hmm. animal sacrifices, but I remember one thing in particular you know, that uh, the Old Testament ceremonial laws have given way to the new covenant and the sacraments and all. But you just point out that, you know, the, uh, the dietary laws, Jesus shows us in the Gospel of Mark in the book of Hebrews just clarifies, it's not what comes into the mouth that defiles you, it's what comes out of the heart. And what a, what a breath of fresh air, what a light, because it's like, Lord, heal my heart. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not going to be primarily the environment or my diet or whatever. It's going to be whether you live in my heart or not, because mm -hmm. if you do, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, what really matter. strikes me about both of you is that you're so passionate about uh, a single letter from the scriptures. I came of age at a time when there were two sorts of people uh, regarding scripture, either those who never read it and they were Catholics, or those who had very little reverence for what they read, and they were scripture scholars. Mm. Uh, here is Scott. I would sometimes think that, you know, if I didn't know the Bible had predated his birth, <laughs> I might have suspected Scott wrote it, because you know it from the inside out. I wish that were true. <laughs> well, it is true, yeah, and apparently you know almost as much. Yeah. I know it from the heart bird. level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, like you can, I mean, but I could I never keep up up here, but on the heart level. And I think that's it. what you do so beautifully yeah. in this, is, is make that connection um, from taking words on a page that, that ought to be alive and can come alive and then making it practical and concrete. But with all that was in there, why, why hope? Why was focus, uh, the hope what you focused mm. on? Good question. I think what really struck me is that, um, and this isn't just women, but my focus very much is women, we're living um, in a postmodern culture and we're breathing it in like carbon monoxide. We don't, we don't even realize the way in which it's affecting us. It's certainly affecting our belief systems, but it's very much causing us to lose hope. And when you think about postmodernism and you know what it is, there's no absolute truth, right? And God, he or she, you know, whichever, if he or she exists, doesn't have anything really to do with me personally. But I think maybe the biggest problem um, in postmodernism as far as hope goes is it says there's no grand narrative. Like it's all just it's all just chance, right? And at the end, it's all meaningless. And so you go through life and you encounter suffering, which is of course what the people who the book of Hebrews was written to were experiencing, tremendous suffering, and you hit it. And if there is no overarching narrative, if there isn't a God that cares about the details of your life, who is actually making sense of things and bringing meaning even into the hardest things, well, then where is our hope going to be? Our hope will have to be rooted in perfect circumstances, mm -hmm. right? right? Yeah. Which would be natural Which hope. rarely happens. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, right. the great Lutheran theologian Robert Jensen wrote an article, How the World Lost Its Story. Mm. And it wasn't just like, where are my keys? You know, for the last 50 years, there has been a, a strategic effort at so many levels and so many university departments to dismantle, to explode the grand narrative or what they call the meta narrative so that there is no script that binds you other than whatever script you script for yourself, you know. And, and as a result, you can't answer the most basic questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? You know, I'm walking, but not with purpose. Yeah. 
And so to rediscover the fact that there is a grand narrative, it's more than a story, it's salvation history, and it didn't end with the resurrection. It's going in now, right now, because of the resurrection. And my life doesn't just find a little bit of meaning. Suddenly, I'm a character in a script that involves a drama greater than anything Hollywood could ever produce or even think of. And I mean, it's not just Hebrews. You do Bible studies in the shorter ones, too. But it always has that journey from the head to the heart. Mm. You know, scripture scholars often just stop at the head and then just yeah. dissect yeah. the scriptures, you know. Yeah. And I, I had a colleague in another institution years ago who's, he was a priest and a biblical scholar, and he wanted to show that the Bible can be dissected so that you can show, as Professor Stanley Fish says, the great postmodernist, that it is a self consuming artifact, that as an interpreter, you can sovereignly dismantle this according to whatever you wish. Mm. And it's like, all right then, this is what we're right. living for, yeah. you know? Yeah. And you know, the, the seminarians who I spoke to were just like disheartened. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what about the parishioners you'll preach to? Right. 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 When, when I was uh, in Rome, I had a course and it was absolutely the worst course I ever had. Mm. Uh, I will tell no names. God knows who he is and will dispatch him in due course. And I think maybe he already has. But it was on the letters of St. Paul. And it was so bone crushingly boring. And it lasted a whole semester. But what he did was murder to dissect, as the poet Wordsworth warns us against. Uh, he reduced uh, this dazzling, overwhelming mystery of God's love for the world to a whole series of lifeless pieces of dead information that maybe you could pluck out of an encyclopedia. It was, it was deadening. It was stultifying. And Paul is the central figure in the New Testament teaching on grace. Right. Mm. They deconstruct your reconstruct. Wait, and that's just it. How do you do yeah. that? How do you do mm. that, Lisa? How do you take this, these ideas from the head to the heart? What's that process look mm. like? Well, that's a fun question. Thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, first of all, I have to interact with the scripture passages just on my own devotionally. And so I do do a tremendous amount. Well, I, I think it's a tremendous amount as a mother of seven, but of studying just what does this mean in the literal sense and, right. you know, really delving into all of that. Um, but then I come at it when I've gotten you know, the background understanding. I understand where it's coming from culturally and, you know, what it means in that sense. And I basically say, what does this mean to me personally? You know, Jesus says, you speak to me through your word. What does this have to do with day-to-day -day life? And, and as I'm writing the study, I am giving the needed background so people can place this in okay. context, right? Because you can take any thing in scripture and make it mean all sorts of things. And of course, that's historically been done. We have to be very careful of that. But when I find that um, these scripture passages have been run through my life, you know, the Lord has, has used them to not just teach me and comfort me and reveal something new about himself to me, but has, you know, has strengthened me and has changed me, mm. has changed me. Yeah. So why do we do this? Like, do we do this just to come together as women in good community? That's, to be honest, a byproduct. We do this because we want to be transformed. Mm -hmm. We want to encounter Jesus personally, and we want him to change us through his word. So when he does that with me personally, very often I have just been studying whatever book it is myself for probably about a year. And then I start to say, okay, and this is how it worked out in my life. So I never write something I haven't experienced. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is sort of like Lexio Divina. I mean, mm. you read the text and then you meditate on what you've read. What does it mean? You try and tease out some application mm. uh, to your life uh, and the fruit is that book. You know, it's, it's like Lexio, and yet I can tell that you've done more than Lexio, and you just indicated how and why, because you've got to, you know, critical scholarship is useful. Hypercritical scholarship is deadening. Mm. You know, you've got to get into the historical and the cultural background. You've got to look at the literary context, study the whole canon to see how the old and the new relate, especially if you're tackling Hebrews. Oh, yeah. But if you stop in the head, it'll just dry up. Mm -hmm. You take it to the heart, you take it to prayer, and then suddenly it starts to bear fruit, not only in your prayer where the Lordship of Christ is showing you the areas of life where he wants you to let him in, but then all of a sudden the floodgates open so that women can come. And you're talking not dozens of parishes, you're talking, what, hundreds? Hundreds. Yeah. Hundreds of parishes where women are finding not only hope to get through the day or hope to get to heaven, but hope to figure out how can I get more of the bread of life? Mm -hmm. How can I get more of scripture? Because it does answer the questions. It, it, it eradicates the doubts as well. 
but at the same time, it opens up this sense like, I'm a cradle Catholic, but this is our book. Right. Yes. You know, it is our book. It's not playing an away game. You know, it's playing a home yeah. game. Yeah. And that's beautiful. I, I don't want to open a, a shower uh, to rain on your parade, but I, I do have one practical question. Sure. Maybe in order to ground these women in hope, it might be helpful to find a babysitter uh, for these kids <laughs> yeah. so that they can park them somewhere, sequester them safely so that they can then plunge into the scriptures. Do you make provision for that? Love that question. We do. It's actually one of the most important things of the program. So when we talk to coordinators about bringing this to their parish, one of the first things we say is you've got to find a woman who's willing to oversee child care. She's, we call her the child care coordinator <laughs> because women need to know their kids are safe and, and they're being well taken care of and we're following all the guidelines, but then you can come and Anytime a parish isn't willing to do that with children, I find that really concerning because who are we gonna lose? Right. We're gonna lose the young moms. Why do we need the young moms? Because their kids are still sponges. Right. They're still willing to hear it from mom and say, okay, well, this is, this is truth. And if you wait till the kids are in school right. to start delving into your spiritual life, you have the heartbreak of coming to know Christ, wanting to tell your kids, and you lost that window. Amen. Yeah. And to that end, we will come back in just a moment or two to be able to continue our conversation on hope. Our prayer life certainly relates to our hope in God. In the first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul speaks about putting on the breastplate of faith and charity and the helmet of the hope of salvation. And I think of that scripture from St. Paul because prayer is really putting on the mind of Christ. It's putting on the helmet, the protection from all the voices of the world. It's centering ourselves in the hope of salvation, looking beyond this world. And that's what our prayer leads us to. It takes us to the Lord who is our hope itself. There is a place where education begins and faith and reason connect. Franciscan University of Steubenville's online programs will advance your career through an e-learning experience that's both academically excellent and passionately Catholic. With online degrees taught by full-time professors in theology, catechetics, business, education, and other disciplines, you can earn your master's degree online without changing your lifestyle. Find out more today at franciscan.edu, where your faith and career can connect online. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents, and we are talking about being grounded in hope, uh, a virtue which I love. How about just a little bit more? You, at the previous section, you were talking about the natural virtue of hope, so maybe just about what is hope? Mm, from a theological perspective. However you okay. want. All right. Yeah. Well, you've got natural hope, right? And so I see that in my eight-year-old daughter. So Charlotte will like sit for the afternoon and color pictures and have a stack like this high. And I'll be like, what are you doing, Charlotte? You know, you're sending these to the grandparents? And she'll say, no, I'm going to sell them in the neighborhood and I'm going to make loads of money. And I look at her, I'm like, you are so certain that you're literally going to sell that whole stack and make loads of money. And that is hope. That is beautiful. That is optimistic. It's not really likely to happen. And sometimes our hope is that we're just hoping for the best. Well, that's not theological hope, right? And it's not rooted in our circumstances at all. It's actually rooted in the trustworthiness of God because it's something that is infused to us. It's given us as a gift rather than something we conjure up from within. Right. Can, can I give you a, an illustration of, yeah. of natural hope? A, a New Yorker cartoon some years ago showed two guys in a prison cell. Mm -hmm. The walls are about eight feet thick and they run a hundred feet high. There's no window, there's no door. And the guy turns to his pal and says, okay, Fred, here's my plan. <laughs> That's <laughs> natural hope. Yeah. yeah, you know, but supernatural hope is what we're really talking about. Yeah. That is the theological virtue mm. that is supernaturally infused. You know, so you have the courage, core from the heart, to face moral difficulties to attain nothing less than heaven, but not only at the end of life, mm. to attain heaven now by opening up the heart to Christ. You know, mm. it's a quote from Hebrews 6.19, as you know, to seize the hope. And when you back up, to the beginning of Hebrews 6, it's a subtle distinction, but it's important because the word of promise that God gave to Abraham is the object of his faith, and it gives him the certitude of faith. But at the same time, he's got challenges. And so 
he asked for something more. And so God adds the oath in Genesis 22, verses 16 to 18, so that through two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to prove false, the word of promise, the certainty of faith, the oath of assurance, which is the assurance of hope. So, you know, I have absolute certainty of everything that God has said is true. But because God has never said in scripture or tradition, Scott Hahn is numbered among the elect, that is not the object of faith. Mm. That is the object of hope. The certainty of faith is the word. The assurance of hope is the oath. And the Latin word for oath, as I discovered when I was still a Protestant, is sacramentum. So to go to worship, word and sacrament gives us the promise, the object of certainty, our faith, but then to ground it personally, practically today in the sacrament, which is God swearing, I will help you. I will see you through all of the difficulties. I'll not only get you home to heaven at the end, I'll get into your heart. And you point out that the anchor of hope is in the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. What does that imply? That our heart is the Holy of Holies. Mm. That's where Christ wants to meet me daily, not just once a year like it was, you know, when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. And, and I'm Deep assuming, stuff. Lisa, that you were, you were looking at the culture and seeing the need for hope right now. So how, how do you speak to that and how do you speak to the women in, in allowing them to find hope in circumstances which are really difficult in, in, on so many levels right now? Mm. What, what was that or, or how do you bring them to that place? I think their stories are really, really important. And back to what you were saying, you know, we one of the beautiful things about Hebrews is you're in the New Testament, so you have the New Covenant and all that that brings to us, but you've got all these flashbacks to the old where you're getting to see the faithfulness of God, the story of salvation throughout it. So that's one of the things I love about the book. And, and we need that. We need to see that historically God has always shown up and seen people through because you come to a woman in her own story and it feels like it's the exception to the rule, right. right? It feels like, but is he going to show up for me? And so it's a matter of meeting a woman where she is at this level, not up here. Right. And, and finding out what is her story. You know, where is that place where the trustworthiness of God came into question for you? Where is that place of hurt or that place of fear or that place of woundedness, whatever it might be, you meet her there, you hear her story, and um, you remind her that all these promises of God that are yes in Christ are yes for her, but we can't hold him to a promise that he never made, right? So that's why we go to scripture to say, well, what has he promised? Mm -hmm. yeah. And how do we find out whether or not he's trustworthy? Well, let's mm -hmm. look and let's look at his track record right. and how has he been for people in that regard? And so um, I feel like scripture really, um, is really helpful just in getting that macro view of the overarching narrative that he has shown up always, he will continue to today. But then I wanna bring it personally um, to the life of a woman and she needs a tool, something that helps her day to day to grab hold of hope because you can have hope in the morning and have lost it by five, you know? <laughs> and so one of the things that I love about the way our studies are structured is each week's lesson is broken down into days. So it's training you, start your morning with your head in scripture and it'll renew your mind and bring you hope. But something that I've started incorporating into the Bible studies I've written more recently and whenever I speak is something called the I declares. And to me, it takes the truths that you know we're talking about in scripture and brings them into the day to the day, day to day, where we say, what are the promises of God that we can hold them to in scripture, where we pray his word back to him and we declare those truths until hope comes back into our hearts and chases out the despair. So I might say, you know, I'm just feeling like I'm suffering and I'm swimming and I'm gonna go under and I'm lacking hope. Right. Yep. And I might say, I declare that no temptation has seized me except what is common to man and God is gonna be faithful and provide a way out so I can stand up under it. First Corinthians 10, 13. I declare that when I am weak, God is strong within me. I declare that there is nothing that I face that he cannot get me through. And you start to quote these Bible verses and, right. and their references and realizing this is true for me today. And we challenge women, pray these things out loud yeah. because the enemy hears, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. right? And so often, what do we say? We, we spew out the litany of all the things that we're discouraged about. He hears all that too and whispers it back. But if we speak out hope and these promises, yeah. that's a weapon, right? Yeah, I, I, I know that women have a special skill set, but do they also have a set of 
discouragements uh, that, mm. that are peculiar uh, to their predicament. I mean, if, mm. if you say Jesus is the answer to the question that's my life, do women have a different question that they put to Christ than, mm. say, men? I mean, is their situation special? Mm. I mean, would that book work for men? It does work for men. I, I've actually heard that quite a bit. Um, I think you have to overlook the pinkness of the cover. That's <laughs> tough, I know, but like rip the cover off and, and you're good to go. And I do know many men use it. I do think there are unique questions in the heart of a woman. And I think that a woman longs to be seen, longs to be known, longs to be considered beautiful, longs to be valued in that way. Yeah. Um, I think that's something specific to women. Um, and I think men, I've at least been told, want to know that I've got what it takes, you know? And so I think there are different things that, you know, when the Lord speaks into those, those needs, um, it meets our hearts in special ways. But your question about, um, not just what is the question, but what is maybe the ache of a woman. What I see over and over again is the ache of losing this next generation. You know, of, of the fact that they have wanted more than anything to pass their faith to the next generation and they haven't known how to do it and very often haven't had tools to do that. And they're watching their children walk away from the church. And I think that is the heartache that I hear the most. You know, Pope Pius XI back in 1930 spoke of how men, you know, are more familiar with the order of authority. And that's why headship applies to them, mm -hmm. not exclusively, mm -hmm. but in a preeminent way, whereas women have primacy in the order of love, yeah. he says. Mm. And so they're the heart of the home. And you think about the Blessed Virgin. You know, she didn't just bear the word made flesh. She bore the future generation, mm. you know. And women bear not Jesus in their own wombs physically, but I do think that they have within the womb, which is below the heart and the head, mm -hmm. but it really is the embodiment of hope. And I, I have said this for years, especially because I've got two family members who are really suffer from the need for hope and the loss of hope, mm -hmm. that hope is the Cinderella of the three virtues. We always talk about the faith and you know sharing it, defending it, and love, love, love. But hope is, I think, the neglected virtue it's also the difficult one. Mm. Uh, and so to have women find hope isn't just you know, something convenient. It's something necessary and essential if God's children are going to be born through these women of hope, these women of God. Mm. Yeah. There's a, a passage in uh, Charles Peggy, who was the great poet of hope, mm. and he pictures her as a little girl who was born just a couple of minutes after Christmas morning. And we watch her going down the street with faith and charity on either side. And from a distance, it appears as if they're carrying hope. But in fact, on closer inspection, they are held by, sustained by yes. hope, this little girl. Without hope, faith and charity would be, would be old women. They wither. And they, yeah. they would wither and die and fall into a ditch. Hope is the really primordial virtue. Chesterton calls it the religion of tomorrow morning. Things are going to be better, yeah. and Christ guaranteed that. Yes. And, and why do you think it's so difficult? Why is hope so difficult to grasp? Why is it that, I mean, that's a beautiful image, but we find so many people disappointed, and we yeah. hear in Romans that hope doesn't disappoint. So how is it, or what's the misconception mm. that the individual has of hope? I think we, we think hope is somehow connected to our circumstances. So it is going to get better tomorrow morning, as in I really do need to see this turn pretty dang fast. And we want our prayers answered on our timetable, and we don't have an eternal perspective at all. You know? And so we, we want it all here. We gauge how good it is based on right now. And so as a result, our sufferings don't really have meaning because we haven't fixed our eyes on heaven. So I think that robs us, you know, mm. of a tremendous amount of hope. We we don't look far enough out. Mm. And you know, we we think it's going to happen somehow here on earth. We we pin our hopes on a on a utopia here, right? Which will never be satisfied. Politicians and, and their promises. Oh, there we go. Oh. And then we're disillusioned, right? And then despair creeps in. And then what we start to feel, I think, especially if we don't really have a strong formation to fall back on of what did God actually promise? Is it's like, you know, I think that this Christian anything was a bit of a bait and switch. Like this isn't delivering yeah. on what I thought it would give. And it's because we're wanting something today that God has promised as a reward in eternity. Yeah. 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 And, and, and tomorrow morning too, but sometimes when you're going through Good Friday, you have to wait 
through Holy Saturday yeah. for Easter Sunday. Yeah. And the resurrection mm-hmm. gives us hope. I, 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 we have a mutual friend, Matt Marr, who sings Christ is risen from mm. the dead. But he never just sings the song. He talks about the death that we have experienced more recently and how this hope isn't just one day out of the year. Mm. It's something that has to be sustaining us. And that imagery too, I, I really believe it's easy to fall out of love when you fall out of hope, when you've lost hope, right? You know, you can give up on the faith because what good is it? But you know, love is just too hard mm. without hope. Right. Right. You know, yeah. you know uh, Joseph Ratzinger in a series of meditations way back in the late '60s spoke of the long Holy Saturday of this present mm. moment that we're enshrouded in a kind of darkness, and it is symbolized by the absence of the Eucharist on Holy Saturday. Those tabernacles have been emptied. God is dead, mm. and we're going through that that period of the absence of God, being God forsaken, and that's the death of hope, mm. and we can't see far enough mm. to know that from Friday to Sunday, there has to be this pause. Mm. That's part of the music, the dark tones, the chords we have to hear. But at the end of that, there's Easter Sunday, you know, this resurrection. He climbs out of the grave. Mm. He's so intensely alive, as Balthazar puts it, that he can, he can survive even death. Yeah. Death can't keep him dead. But what's going on on Holy Saturday, I think is so important that we not lose sight of, because if you tell a person, just grit your teeth and get right, through hold it. Your breath. Right. That can be a long wait, and that's okay. pretty miserable. If you can say, this is where the maturing is happening. Yeah. This is where you're becoming like Christ. You know, it's not in the, you know, rainbows and sunshine moments. And don't we want to become like him? Don't we want to be mature yeah. followers of Christ, not superficial ones? Yeah. And it's all happening on Holy Saturday. It's not, yeah. you're not just treading water. It's not for nothing. It's yeah. actually where the Spirit is doing His deepest work And that He hasn't left you. And we do want to become mature Christians, and we'll talk about that next. So stay with us uh, in Franciscan University Presents. A great example of having the theological virtue of hope while at the same time feeling the feeling, emotional feeling of despair, is Jesus on the cross, who, when he saw that he was going to die, there was no way out, expressed that despair, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? But that despair is not the sin of despair. It's not a choice to refuse the the help of God. It was the feeling that follows the understanding that there's no way out, but he had theological hope that in three days, as he knew he was going to rise from the dead by the power of God and he himself, the Son of God, And so, look at Psalm 28, verse 8. The Lord is the strength of His people. He is the saving refuge of His anointed. What if you discovered a university with unmatched science, faculty, and programs? A place where you didn't have to choose science over faith. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith-inspired, student-focused, research-driven programs leading to satisfying careers in medicine, scientific research, engineering, computer science, and many more science and health fields. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, education is more than just a word, it's a discovery. Welcome back and thanks so much for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents, and we record this program in the Com Arts studio here at Franciscan University of Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and the equipment. They always do a great job. And members of our theology faculty, Dr. Martin and Dr. Hahn, who also always do a great job, and I are discussing ways to become grounded in hope with our guest, Lisa. Uh, Lisa, you close at the end of talking about this, this process of maturing in hope and maturing in our faith. It's interesting. So hope isn't just something we get and we got it. We can actually grow in it. It can develop. What is that? How Mm -hmm. does that happen? Well, I think it grows in us as we grow in our deep belief at the heart level of the trustworthiness of God. That's really where it's rooted. Why do you think? uh, It's probably, that's one of the things I probably hear most as a priest is an inability to trust God. Yeah. God is a God who is so faithful, who always keeps His promises, and it's just fundamental to who He is. Why is it that we have a hard time trusting? How about that for a big question? Okay, that's a big question. <laughs> here's, Figure this out for okay. us and we can move on. Here's, here's what I think. I think that um, the battle's in the head, but this is where it originates. Mm. 
So something happens to us that has been, you know, deeply hurtful, deeply, you know, wounding where, you know, we're in this moment and our first thought is, I never ever want to feel like this again. You know, it can be any sort of a circumstance. And in that moment that we start to say, okay, what am I gonna have to do so that I never feel like this again? The temptation to only rely on ourselves and just kind of pull in gets really, really strong. And in that moment, when we are down for the count at our lowest, at our most hurt, that's when the enemy Amen. leans in right. and starts to whisper lies. And they're lies that are very much connected to our identity as children of God, he brings that into question and he brings into question the goodness of God. So he starts to say things like, you're all alone. Right. You're powerless. Yeah. Nobody sees. Nobody sees Nobody's you, right. you know, and if you ever speak of this, you know, it will be the end of the world. And he speaks these lies. The problem is that in that moment, because we are at our lowest, they make sense because it's what we're feeling. And instead of our, in that moment, battling back with the truths that we know about God, whether it be from our own experience or what we know of scripture, we start to go, that does make sense. I am all alone. What do I have to do so that I never feel like this again? I'm not going to rely on anyone. Right. I'm not going to let anyone in. I'm not, I'm not going to let anyone trust. And we build this barrier around our heart. And what we're trying desperately to do is to remain safe, to remain in control. And we don't even realize no. that we've bought into a lie about the trustworthiness of God, about His goodness as our Father. Right. Yeah. You know? But isn't, isn't it also the case that people are unable to turn trustingly to God because so often they have been betrayed by his image, the image of God, their, their husband, their father, their friends. Uh, whom can I trust? They have no experience of trust. Yeah. You know, I think this is the key because you mentioned life experience, personal experience, yeah. and scripture. Very few people have life experience that is sufficient to fall back on. You know, I think most people look at their life experience at least most Catholics, and they're looking at like mostly a blank page with some doodling. Mm -hmm. You know, like, yeah, okay, when I was 14, and other points too, you know, we were talking last night at dinner with mm -hmm. Jim Caviezel, kind of a, a unique experience. Mm -hmm. And when he played Jesus Christ, and he was on the cross, struck by lightning, you know, he was given hope, you know. Yeah. Very few people have experiences like playing Jesus Christ and the Passion of the Christ. Or being struck by yes, lightning. Or being well. struck by right. lightning, too. <laughs> and he had other experiences to relate over the course yeah. of a year. You know, and I'm just thinking, most of us are bereft of any of that. Right. But this is where Scripture comes in, because if you know the story, you can find your place in it. But if you're reading the New Testament apart from the Old, I can't help but say that the New Testament is almost in unintelligible apart yeah. from the fulfillment of these promises. And so, what do you do? Well, you just can't overcome biblical illiteracy in a day. So, what you do, you know, in various points, Sam, uh, Sam Wisegamji and, and yeah. Frodo are carrying the ring of power up Mount Doom, you know. And so, you're plugging them into the stories that, you know, not only rekindle hope, but also show hopeless situations and, you know, you're looking at, you know, why would Gandalf give that ring to that little hobbit and expect him? Why would God give me these personal problems and expect me mm. to get through today? And, you know, you have to fill in the gaps. You just can't say, well, study the Old Testament, then you'll discover a mm. father who's keeping all of those promises. But you're right. I mean, I do think that the breakdown of trust is the single right. greatest wound in the hearts of women, and but also men, because they don't have fathers they can trust. Right. And so, it's like, you know, you've got to come to Jesus in order to really find the way to the Father. And to that end, uh, that's important. A part of that is that ability to come to Jesus. So, you speak about the relationship between prayer and hope, the relationship mm -hmm. between the sacraments and hope. Mm -hmm. So, maybe you speak about how, how we can be drawn into a deeper hope by relationship with just how do you pray, and how do you go to Mass, mm. and how do you do so celebrate the sacraments. Sure. Well, you know, I think one of my favorite illustrations about prayer is going through your life thinking you're going to live the victorious Christian life without prayer. It's like saying, I'm going to clean my house and vacuum, but you haven't actually plugged the vacuum cleaner in. And you're just doing this all the time. You're like, why is it not getting better? Why is it not getting right, cleaner? Right. So we've got to plug in. We've got to plug in through prayer. We've got to plug in through the sacraments. That's where we're going to, where we're going to receive the power and the means by which we can live, you know, live out the Christian life. As to, you know, how I pray, I do think I have kind of a unique way of, of praying for myself and of interceding for others. And so, um, obviously, I want to protect hope in my own life and, and develop and cultivate that virtue, but I want to see it in the lives of 
There's always someone on my heart, I find, each year that's especially heavy on my heart who I know is struggling with despair okay, and who I know is really lacking hope. And I had one moment in my life where that was so acute where my concern for that loved one was almost debilitating because the despair was so deep and in the darkness was, was so acute. And I found the only thing that helped me was interceding for this person in a very particular way. And what I did um, is I took a Bible, which I hadn't yet read, and I downloaded a guide to reading through the Bible in a year. And I decided I was going to claim every word of scripture over the life of my loved one, over my child. And I was going to underline every promise to claim, every example to follow, every example not to follow. And I was going to hold God to his word and say, <laughs> you have promised this. Yeah. And so in the margins of the Bible, I wrote those prayers. And so I prayed that over a year, over that child's life. And I tell you, I saw the tide turn. Mm -hmm. And two things were happening at the same time. I was saying to God, this is who you, who you are. Right. And I'm just, you know, calling to mind your goodness and your faithfulness and your promises. I saw his hand move miraculously mm -hmm. in the life of my loved one. But it did something in my heart because if you remember, I began by saying I was the one who was also in a state because I was so worried. But reading that much scripture on a daily basis really was the only thing that settled my heart and gave me hope to know he is so above this. Like his, the grand narrative is right. so beyond Absolutely. us. Yeah. You know, it said that God too is a hoper. He hopes mm. that we'll turn to him yeah. mm -hmm. and beseech him because he wants to help, but he wants to be asked. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's an amazing story. That is really quite thrilling. Mm. Yeah. You know, claim the promises is what we always heard as evangelicals. Yeah. But of course, that's not something Catholics can do. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it is something that we have to do. We have to do. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the poet uh, Emily Dickinson speaks of hope as the thing with feathers that mm. perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Mm. It springs eternal. It, it's sort of native to the human heart, this mm. desire, this longing that things will be better. Somebody said that the reason bananas are curved, uh, this, this really amused me. Good. This should be good. <laughs> yeah. The reason they're curved is because they were originally straight when they fell from, when they dropped from the tree, but because they want to get back to the sun, they curve upward because that's the whole thrust of their being. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's tropism. Everything longs for the light. Theotropism is when the creature longs for the sun, the, mm -hmm. the helios, the true light, and that's hope. This movement in a direction we can't quite chart, but we sense, we instinctively know the outcome is a good one. God is not going to cheat us. Right. He's not setting us up for some supreme setback. In my experience shows me that when you meet an individual who has hope that there's something contagious about that. that and maybe speak to that. Your, your experience is how you have been, I'm sure, a model of hope for other people, but how does that how does that work in your heart when you meet somebody that's filled with hope and, and how can we be that for one mm. another? I think you meet someone and um, I don't know, maybe this is just me and my weirdness, but I really like to meet a person at that point of pain. Like I don't have a lot of time for small talk and I wanna go there and say, you know, where is that pain point in your life right. and speak to that. And I find more often than not that, you know, there can be some kind of a connection there because so often our difficult experiences are common, right, right to man. And so you, sp you give that time, right? You, you see the person where they are and you acknowledge that that's a part of reality. And then you build the hope from there. You don't just start with the, you know, the solution or the hope or everything's gonna be great, it's all gonna be good because it causes a person to feel unseen. Not doing something right, right. Right? But when you meet in that place where you're like, oh no, I, I can relate to that kind of suffering, you know, I'm not in the annoying me too. Yeah, no, my story's better. Mine's the topper. But just that connection, right. seeing them, and then going from there to talk about, but God is still going to show up in this. God is faithful in this. This is not the exception to the rule. I find that moment, bringing the hope in at that point, can be quite contagious. And it's one of the things when we um, train leaders to lead walking with purpose, it's really important to us that the materials be solid and applicable, but the leadership be of a certain type. We talk about the importance of an outpouring of love for women. And another of our values is fearless positivity. Mm -hmm. That women are, we are attracted to that. We need right. to know that there is hope and there is goodness and it's not all going to hell in a handbasket. Right. 
you know. Yeah, you, know yeah. you know, somebody said, don't talk about Christ unless somebody is asking you, but live your life in such a way that they want to ask you yeah. about Christ. Right. What makes you so different? Why do you have this, this spring in your step? Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, I think a lot of people confuse hope with optimism mm. because they don't distinguish the the natural hope that people have because they're optimists yeah. and the supernatural hope that all of us are supposed to have because Christ is risen. You know, so I do think that it's helpful for people like me who are not optimists but who have hope but need more to hang around people like Kimberly, my bride, because mm. she is an optimist, an eternal yeah. optimist. Yeah. And since grace builds on nature, the more optimistic natural hope there is, the more that can be supernaturalized. And so to be around her is to be around someone who's radiating hope. Mm. And, you know, we've gone through dark times and, and she has difficulty understanding the depression that goes through my family line. Mm. She can enter into it, but not like I can with my kids. At the same time, she's gone through enough suffering to know that the Lord is faithful. He'll not only see us through it, he's going to bring a better body out of the tomb than what was buried. You know, and it's like, yeah, that's what I need to seize. That's the kind of hope that goes beyond optimism. You know, that goes beyond a presidential election or a national championship. You know, this is what unites us as family, but not just the Hans, but all of God's sons and daughters. Mm. This father has shown us in his son, my goodness, Easter just rewrites the script of human history in terms of hope. And Lisa, I think that's what you've done with gathering the women together is that mm. it provides them an opportunity to share that story where where one woman may be experiencing a difficulty that day, the other woman might be able to encourage them. So that gathering together is key for your ministry, is it not? Absolutely. And I think we want women when they come to know you matter, you, your story, your particular struggles, your particular hopes and dreams, you matter. We want them to know truth matters. That's why you know we're rooting ourselves in scripture and in the teachings of the church and the catechism. And then we also want to say in relationships matter, mm. right? We weren't meant to live in isolation. We can't live the Christian life well in isolation. And so then we facilitate these communities where women taste all three mm. at the same time. And it really does become a lifeline. I hear that over and over again. I, I literally hear women say it has saved their life. And mm -hmm. um, cause we need all three of those things. You know, yeah. childcare by the way, is one thing that I want to mention again, because Kimberly had a Bible study with childcare and the women related later, this was life training. This is real life right here. Too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and up next, our panel and our guest will share our final thoughts on how to become grounded in hope. Please stay with us. The emotions of hope and the contrary despair are emotions you feel in your body, in your endocrine system. When you perceive some evil that's overcoming you and you can't get away from it, the emotion is despair. Uh, when you see some evil, you think you can overcome it and it's difficult, you might have the emotion of hope. This is different than the theologically infused virtue of hope from the Holy Spirit. You don't feel this. You might feel the effects of it, but you might not. The theologically infused virtue of hope is the power that God gives you to trust in Him and His promises that He will save you, that He has the ability to do so, and that He loves you and wants to do so. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment. So Regis, if you could start us. With yeah, your I'm, final a, I'm really full of admiration for what you've done, but I'm also marveling at, at all three of you. I mean, Father Dave, you always inspire me. I'm sure. But, but this particular session, I mean, here's Scott with this throwaway line that he had dinner with Jim Caviezel. I mean, we, as if it, this happens all the time. You know, I, I have dinner maybe with a couple of cats and, <laughs> and, and my wife. Uh, and then you, I, I suspect that if you sit down to have a cup of tea with a friend, you cut right to the chase. Mm -hmm. You don't talk about the weather uh, or the length of her hemline. None of that matters. You want to get them straight on the Pauline Express. Uh, let me end with, with this. It seems to me that in approaching faith, there are two 
contrasting attitudes that people take. Some people view faith as this ideal. It's out there, it's distant, it's almost unattainable. But maybe at the 11th hour, God will swing a special deal and sweep me into the kingdom. But until then, I'm in the grip of a kind of despairing moralism. I struggle, I stumble, I fall. I just make a complete wreck of my life. Because Christianity is this ideal that's almost unattainable. But the other attitude, which I think is more Catholic, is to view Christianity as the center of the cosmos, and I'm living out of that center. So it's not an ideal towards which I have to move, but it's a center from which I radiate out to the very ends of the universe, and that gives me hope. That gives me the bounce. Uh, it gives me a sense that, you know, things are going to be pretty good because the outcome has already been uh, guaranteed by uh, this dead God uh, who conquered uh, the grave. Amen. Mm. Yeah. Scott. Okay, I want to just summarize a few practical takeaways for those women especially who are watching because Catholic women's Bible study has to become a better growth industry than it is. Yeah. <laughs> Second, walking with purpose. We're not just talking about one Bible study on Hebrews grounded in hope. We're talking about walking with purpose. We're talking about not just thousands of women, but over 400 parishes. And I believe that this is a work of God. And even though it's reaching thousands, I think it needs to reach millions. And uh, in the evangelical world, especially wherever you see growth, explosive, deep spiritual growth, invariably the women are involved, small groups especially, and the, the Word of God, sacred scripture. And, you know, even if they're outsiders or beginners with questions or people who've been Catholics all their lives but still have doubts, you know, this kind of stuff is the food for the soul. You can't satisfy your hunger by watching the Food Channel. You know, you've got to actually partake of the bread of life. And uh, you come away, like the Cappadocians would say, with a sober inebriation from the wine of God's Word. It's bread, it's wine, you know, it's the other side of what we celebrate in the Eucharist. And so the last takeaway is thank you and may your tribe increase. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, thank you. Lisa, thank you so much for being with us. Your oh, final thoughts. My joy. Um, you know, I think the key question we all need to wrestle with is why, why should we trust Jesus to be the source of our hope? Why should we put all our eggs in that basket? And as I think about it, and I think about the book of Hebrews, I think, well, we could say because he's superior, because he's all powerful, because of his glory. But when I think about the why, why he's deserving of all of it, of our placing our trust in him, it's his sheer goodness and his pure love for us. And I think about um, what it takes for a person to open up their heart and trust in God and place their hope in Christ. And we could come with, you know, the most incredible scientific arguments for the existence of God. We could show hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in Christ that would just blow your mind and you'd think, oh, this is amazing. We could present the Christian worldview and say clearly, this is the superior one. But none of that moves the heart if the heart does not trust. Mm. Okay, so the heart needs to know it's safe with God. So God knew that, and he knew that we weren't gonna be won over by arguments, a, a perfectly crafted debate. He knew we were gonna be won over by love. And so he looked at us and he said, so what's the core problem here? The core <laughs> problem is this gap between you and me, and it's been created by sin, and I can't bridge that gap by saying sin doesn't matter. You can't bridge that gap by making your way over to me with your good works and always being better and better. There's always gonna be something that falls short. And so what he did is he said, I'm going to not only bridge that gap, but in doing so, I'm gonna do it through love. And I'm gonna answer the question for now and for always of just how trustworthy I am. And so yes, thinking back to the passion of the Christ and the way that we are able to understand, yes, my heart is actually safe with God in all of its most vulnerable and tender places, those places where I'm afraid to hope, is by focusing on the cross. And if that seems sterile and just kind of like, just like a creed that you're reciting and isn't coming from here, I challenge you to watch the passion again, because that suffering is what Jesus was doing to win our salvation and bridge that gap, but also to say, I am trustworthy. This is how far I'm willing to go for you. Love for you. stronger than death. Yes. Love stronger than death. 
And that's where the ability and the grace to be able to celebrate that, particularly during Easter, mm -hmm. and, and that, that it's not the end of the story, obviously. That's the end. It's, 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 it leads us to the end, so that's wonderful. So if you'd like to learn more about today's topic, we have an article that was uh, written by Lisa. It's free. It's uh, taken from Grounded in Hope, the Bible study, and it will be yours if you simply go online to faithandreason.com or call the number that you're going to see at the bottom of the screen in just a moment. Uh, hope is one of my favorite themes in, in being able to pray and reflect. Uh, it's been said that I, we can live without food for something like 40 days, 40 days, and then water with something eight days, oxygen, three minutes. Mm. Uh, we can't live for a moment without hope. Mm. Hope is ultimately what, what sustains us and what keeps us going. And it's interesting, I was praying one time and, and I would never have thought the word because in the scripture was a really important word. And yet I was praying through Romans 5 and I got stuck on the word because. Text says, hope does not disappoint. And for so many people that I've experienced, that I've met, they're disappointed, which raises the question, what is it that we put our hope in? Hope is not wanting good things. Hope isn't desire. Hope isn't even prayer. Hope is something different than that. And, and I've shared many times that my mom's got multiple sclerosis and has had MS since I was five years old, and I've prayed thousands and thousands. Of, if my hope is in God healing her, I'm going to be frustrated. I'm going to be angry. I'm going to question whether or not God is trustworthy and all of those things. So I think one of the dangers is that we place our hope in places that it is never supposed to be. So Paul says, hope does not disappoint because and everybody should lean in, right? Mm -hmm. Because, lean in, all right? Because the love of God has been poured forth into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's why we can hope. We can hope because no matter what's going on, no matter who the president is, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what's going on in our family, and, and all of those difficulties are true and in, in, in part of our story, but we don't get lost in that because the love of God has been poured forth into our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And to the degree that that's been our experience, that this isn't just a story, or it's not just something that was written, but that each one of us has experienced that love of God that has literally been poured into our heart. And I love that where scripture says that it is not rationed, right? It just continues to pour. If that becomes our experience, if that becomes our reality, if that becomes the starting place for us, um, then we can say hope does not disappoint. So thank you so much for reminding us. Amen? <laughs> so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for placing your word on Lisa's heart and her sharing that with us. We pray that you would continue to shower us with your Holy Spirit, that we would live in your hope, and that your hope would remind us of your promises, and that you are a God who is always faithful, who is always true, who is always loving. May Almighty God pour His blessings on you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Download a free handout on today's topic at faithandreason.com, where you can also watch past episodes of Franciscan University Presents. Or request the handout by emailing us at presents at franciscan.edu or reach us by phone for today's handout by calling 800-783-6447 that's 800-783-6447